Hello. Hello. Dr. Rajiv, are you there? Hi, I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, so we'll start. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue, and we have Pursue 6J, which is liver and GI pathology, and we are streaming live from Al Salam Hospital, Kuwait, via Kolkata. And the topic of today is something very intriguing and very interesting, which is approach to small GI biopsies and polyps. Although the GI biopsies, which are very small, but they carry a lot of information, and it is very important for us to exactly decipher this information, and to talk about this and to explain the intricacies of this small GI biopsies, we have with us Dr. Raja Guru, who is a postgraduate from PGI Chandigarh a DNB and a specialist pathologist from Al Salam Hospital, Kuwait. He's a very reputed pathologist and has interest in GI and liver pathology. And who better than him to talk about this very interesting and very important topic in GI, which is small GI biopsies and polyps. This is the first session and we'll have more than two more sessions of this to explain the entire gamut of GI biopsies and polyp. Before I ask Dr. Raja Guru to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Raja Guru, sir, please share your screen and start the presentation. Thank you. Hello, sir. Good evening. Thanks once again for this warm introduction. And it's nice to meet you all again in this wonderful platform uh, to take a new uh, lecture that is uh, uh, on GI biopsies approach and uh, approach to GI polyps as well. So I'll start presenting my screen. Is it fine? Yeah, it is there. Just make it full screen, okay. please. Is it fine now? Yeah, fine. And just remove that hide, yeah. And yeah. You, you, you have to keep your voice a bit higher on the tone so that oh. we can hear you. Yes, definitely, sir. Am I clear now? Yeah, you yeah, want yeah, to yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, please start. Thank you so much. So I'll go ahead. Fine. Yes, so to start with, uh, uh, before going on to the, uh, the approach to GI biopsies, the first and foremost is the biopsy orientation which is very important when we are dealing with the GI biopsy, particularly the small biopsies. Uh, what we get from the endoscopist or the, uh, the gastroenterologist is filter paper mount where the uh, tissues are placed on tissue filter papers, or like the, the, the inner surface, the deeper surface, which is formed by the muscularis mucosae, uh, most of the times will be placed on the filter paper from which the plasma will come out and it will stick on to the filter paper and <clears throat> the surface will be formed by the mucosa. So this will has to be processed on a hole um, in the tissue cassette and then uh, while the technician uh, embeds it, he can make use of that and he can uh, rotate it to 90 degrees and embed it. So this is particularly of use when it uh, comes with small bowel and colon. Also, uh, in gastric biopsies also, it really helps a lot. So, interpretation um, requires proper orientation. So, when it comes with the, uh, the small bowel and the colon, you should have at least four continuous villi and the crypts, uh, which are, uh, you know, perpendicular to the uh, muscularis mucosae. That is how a properly oriented biopsy looks like. So, start thing with so we'll go on to the stomach uh, the then the small intestine and then the colon so i think the esophagus was covered by quite extensively by dr roja so i'll not be covering about the esophag esophagus so here today <coughs> since it is divided uh, in for three days so i'll try to cover stomach and uh, small intestine tomorrow uh, today and then for the next session i'll try to uh, go with colon and the approach to polyps uh, of the GI tract. To the stomach, the anatomy is very important, you know, from where the biopsy is taken. 
because uh, each have uh, different pathologies. So, and the endoscope is also biopsy from that particular site where he is interested to know about. So, in the stomach, you have the cardia, fundus, body, and the antrum, and each has different type of uh, the glands. So, the cell types are different. So, the cardia and the antrum, they are mucinous glands. So, the body and the fundus, they are oxyntic type of glands with the G cells and the parietal cells. So, the cardia, they, uh, cardia and the antrum almost look similar. You know, uh, with the foveolar epithelium, which will be uh, dipping down into the mucosa only uh, uh, to a larger extent. That is, it will be covering about 50% of the mucosa and the glands will be formed by the, the other 50% will be formed by the glands. And uh, the, when we take the body mucosa, the surface foveolar epithelium will be dipping down to only approximately around 25% and then the rest 75% will be formed by the uh, good bulk of oxyntic glands which will be lined by the, uh, the parietal cells and the chief cells. Uh, in, uh, in the subsequent slide, we'll be showing the histological image also. The main constituent of the neuroendocrine cells when it comes to the antrum will be the G cells. And the G cells will be absent in the, uh, the body and the fundus mucosa. This has significance, which I'll be telling it later. So this is how uh, your body mucosa will look like, where, as I told, the, the foveolar epithelium will be dipping down just uh, in, in the superficial area. And then the predominant mucosa will be formed by the oxyntic glands. Whereas in the antrum, uh, this is the surface. Actually, it is a cut which has taken out the mucosa. This way it is just turned over. That is why it's like this. But uh, the surface epithelium is over here. And the foveolar epithelium are dipping down into. And it's occupying almost 50%. And the rest 50% is formed by these type of mucinous glands. And these mucinous glands are, are different. Uh, they they are painly stained with uh, the eosin compared to that of the foveolar epithelium and completely different from the oxyntic uh, glands which are lined by the parietal cells and the G cells. So by looking at the slide, you can say the site of the biopsy, like where uh, the biopsy has been taken from. So uh, And this also has clinical significance. So in the report, it's, it is always right to mention the uh, site, whether it is body mucosa or uh, body or fundal mucosa, or it is a uh, antral mucosa. So where usually uh, we get the biopsies from? According to Sydney system, we have to get five biopsies, two from the antrum, two from the corpus, and one from the incisor angularis. But usually where do we get from? We get it from the antrum most of the times, you know, we, the bulk is from the antrum because the bulk of the cases is going to be to see whether H. pylori is present or not. That is what the clinicians are interested about. But like when uh, they are finding some abnormality in the body and the fundus or something on the whole, this picture is completely different. They can take biopsies from elsewhere, the body and the fundus. And cardia, usually we don't get that frequently, but whenever we are dealing something with the reflex esophagitis, or in cases of uh, ultra short segment barrett esophagus, cardia might be sampled. Uh, so that is one uh, thing which we'll have to keep in mind. You know, uh, like you should not think that wh why this cardiac mucosa is looking like an antral mucosa. So uh, the mucinous glands in the cardia will just look like the antral mucosa that we'll have to keep in mind. So what we'll have to look for is first is the clinical history. Uh, since, as I told, most of the times it's going to be the uh, H. pylori related gastritis. But in certain cases, you will need a clinical history. So after you see a biopsy, you find something different, you go and check the patient's file or you speak with the clinician about what the clinical history was and what the, what, what the patient is actually having. So then is the endoscopic appearance in the site. So... Uh, certainly it will be important in uh, particular uh, disease conditions where the site of endoscopy uh, was where the biopsy uh, from where it has been taken uh, and the appearance also is very important. Uh, most of the times we don't get to see the endoscopic picture so you can request your uh, clinical colleagues to send the endoscopic picture or always refer to the patient's file because most of the uh, endoscopy reports are attached to the colored photograph of the uh, endoscopic picture. So you can always view that. 
and the main thing is that like you will have to say whether there is gastritis or not whether you have the, the mucosa which you see is inflamed or not which is what uh, the uh, the clinical colleagues are interested in and <clears throat> so for saying that you need to say, say, see what is normal in the occipital mucosa and the anterior mucosa see this stomach is one side which is completely possicellular you see very sparse inflammation uh, that might not be the same with the small bowel and the colon where if you don't see the inflammatory cells then that that it is pathological but in anterior mucosa you don't get to see any inflammatory cells it is usually sparse Uh, the antrum usually shows a little bit more of uh, inflammatory cells compared to the occipital mucosa occipital mucosa is like a, uh, is a terminology which i use for the body and the fundus both are having the occipital glands so it is like called as occipital mucosa so when you call it as a gastritis is when you have more than five mononuclear cells is what is given in the literature so but you this definitely can't follow that but like when you see the lamina propria is a little bit more blue than usual you call it as gastritis and uh, try to avoid the terminology non specific uh, it's always better to be specific with the uh, finding so even if you don't find anything like h pylori or anything which uh, you can report of just say it is mild chronic gastritis that will be all fine so try to avoid the terminology non specific and another important cell is the neutrophil if neutrophils are present in the lamina propria that means that it is pathological uh, it always means there is some active inflammation going on uh, in the foveal epithelium uh, if it is in infiltrating the foveal epithelium we call it as activity if it is inside the pit then we call it as a pit abscess and so on so uh, neutrophils has if it is present it is uh, it, it it should be uh, you know uh, noted and uh, just that it has to be differentiated uh, from those neutrophils which are lying within the small capillaries just that we'll have to make sure that i think uh, uh, that would not be a problem so but uh, presence of neutrophils any number of neutrophils even a single neutrophil in the lamina propria is significant and you will have to uh, give it as whether it is an acute gastritis or an active gastritis chronic gastritis or chronic active gastritis and always according to sydney we will have to use a three tier of grading like mild moderate and severe and the presence of lymphoid aggregate uh, in, in the uh, usually you see some lymphoid aggregate in the body mucosa which will not be a reactive uh, which will not show reactive germinal center if it is showing reactive germinal center then it is pathological and these are mostly related to h pylori and if they are numerous you call it as a follicular gastritis so uh, saying these like uh, there are three types of uh, gastritis uh, these are non atrophic whatever i am talking about uh, are non atrophic forms of gastritis so here you have anterior predominant uh, corpus predominant or pan gastritis so the, in details i'll be discussing in the subsequent slides so the next important thing which we'll have to see about is the h pylori so we are all all are interested in h pylori the clinicians and the pathologists so we'll have to give a, a grading for the h pylori as well mild, mild moderate and severe and only special stains are useful uh, when it when the load is very less we are not able to see enough uh, organism on hne we can use a jeeps of stain or uh, ihc if it is available uh, i have not worked with the h pylori ihc and <clears throat> and the h pylori organism can be seen in any site of the uh, the uh, stomach can be seen in it is commonly seen in the antrum but can also be seen in the fundus body the cardia and also even the first part of the duodenum uh, if there is foveal metaplasia due to um, uh, increased acid secretion the main problems when it comes to identifying h pylori so whenever it is there in the antrum with active inflammation it is so simple but you know where we have certain problems like uh, when uh, the patients use proton pump inhibitors in these days the proton pump inhibitors are easily available over the counters uh, any country be it, even in the developed countries they are easily available and like when our patient is suffering from acidity they just go to the counter and they they, they pharmacist and then they uh, get the proton pump inhibitor drug so uh, when they take that 
there is uh, a significant reduction in the H pyloric load in the antrum uh, as well as the inflammation in the antrum. And what happens in the body, the inflammation in the organism shifts to the body. The exact cause uh, is uh, due to reduction in the acid secretion uh, might be the reason, uh, you know, uh, because the colonization happens in the body. Um, so when uh, you get a biopsy where uh, the antrum looks completely fine or shows mild inflammation and then the body mucosa shows, you know, significant inflammation, you don't have to uh, think of that, I, whether am I dealing with, you know, autoimmune gastritis or not. So it is always uh, better to look in for the organism and in such a case you can ask a history of uh, proton pump inhibitor use. And <clears throat> then like uh, uh, the uh, normal looking body mucosa can also show presence of H. pylori. So in that case like uh, there are certain cases where we uh, might not get a biopsy from the antrum and we simply get a biopsy from the body and like you know uh, most of us uh, have the feeling that like okay this biopsy is non-inflamed it doesn't show inflammation at all so possibly that there will be no H. pylori so we will not be interested to go to a 40x and like you know screen for an H. pylori because the mucosa looks absolutely fine and there is not going to be any organism at all but I think uh, since uh, you know uh, the H. pylori without causing uh, inflammation in the body it can be present so uh, we'll have to uh, look for if uh, the body mucosa is the only sample in the tissue but if you are having an antral mucosa again uh, you know the organism might not be present but you can uh, see the other punches for inflammation and presence of organism the next is uh, the organism is not present but you are having chronic active gastritis so that might be the case when the patient is taking any antibiotics for some other disease. So that could be a reason or if the treatment for H. pylori has been started and the treatment is unsuccessful. So still the inflammation subsides, it, uh, it is an unsuccessful treatment. So uh, only the absence of uh, organism doesn't prove that it is a successful treatment. E even the inflammation has to be absent. And the next is the cockide form which I'll be showing a picture later. So this is how a classical H. pylori organism will, will look and like we'll be happy to see this uh, loaded organism and then just reported uh, that presence of H. pylori organism and then grade it as uh, chronic active gastritis with H. pylori related chronic active gastritis like that. The next, uh, as I told that cockroach forms are uh, uh, seen in um, uh, this uh, helicobacter pylori uh, and you know this has been uh, thought of as a dormant form morphologically dormant form uh, which uh, the uh, the organism adapt to uh, uh, you know in an unfavorable condition but uh, this paper is, has shown that even this cockoid forms can result on uh, uh, chronic active or active gastritis so it is important to find these, but uh, you know it is very difficult. Like uh, without immunohistochemistry, uh, I don't think so. I'll be able to report a cockroach form of uh, H. pylori without the normal, uh, the uh, curved bacilli or the spiral bacilli. So this is w one image from the Twitter. Uh, uh, like the the cockroach forms are uh, in clumps. Uh, they are colonizing the surface epithelium and then you can see the IHC beautifully stating these organisms. So this, like if you have the facility of doing IHC, you can always report it. Uh, if not, you know, uh, you can report the uh, uh, pathology there as chronic active gastritis and the clinician can rely on the uh, CLO test uh, for the presence or absence of organism. So next is that the, there is another species called the Helicobacter uh, helmani which are long organism compared to that of the uh, H. pylori. They have uh, multiple spirals and they are thick and long. Um, it will be easily visualized using the H. and you don't need special stains at all. But just uh, we'll have to keep in mind that we'll have, we should not confuse them uh, with some contaminant to just come from the water bath or something. So just to keep in mind and uh, the the ulcers and erosions are much less common uh, when it comes to Hillmanni uh, comparing with the H. helicobacter pylori.
uh, we'll go with the atrophy of the glands. So here atrophy can involve the antrum and the uh, body or the uh, fundal mucosa. So uh, it has also to be it has to be graded as mild, moderate, and severe. And the location again is very important. So where you are dealing with whether it is in the antrum, the atrophy, whether it is in the antrum or in the uh, corpus. So this is an example of non-metaplastic atrophy. You have two types of atrophy. One is uh, non-metaplastic, uh, and the other one is metaplastic. This is uh, an image from the uh, body mucosa where you can see this, uh, as I showed in the previous image for the histology. You have a good thickness of the glands here, which is composed of all these auxentic uh, cells and uh, the foveal epithelium. And here it is atrophied. The thickness has reduced significantly, and you see a lot of inflammation. As you see, it can be patchy also. See, this area is composed of the normal mucosa, which is like bulky, and then at the end it is atrophic here. So it can be patchy and can give a nodular appearance to the stomach. The metaplastic atrophy can be of uh, three types. Basically, I've shown two images. One is the pyloric type, where the glands they undergo metaplastic change uh, to the uh, the glands which are in the uh, pyloric, the antral uh, mucosal glands, and they lose the parietal cells and the, the chief cells, and they appear more mucinous. Uh, this is pyloric type, and then is the intestinal metaplasia, which I don't have to explain. And there is pancreatic acinar metaplasia also, and you can mention that uh, atrophic uh, gastritis uh, showing intestinal type or pyloric type metaplasia, like that. So next, again, the challenges we will face is that when do you call it as a site predominant uh, gastritis, like uh, the antral predominant or a corpus predominant? Uh, the difference in the grade of inflammation should be more than equal to two. Like, like if the uh, the body mucosa is showing uh, severe gastritis, then the antral mucosa should show only mild or no gastritis. So that is what it is. If it, if the antral mucosa is showing moderate gastritis, the body mucosa is showing severe gastritis. Is gastritis it cannot be called as uh, corpus predominant gastritis. So the the difference has to be more than equal to two. And when in case of the site is not known, like uh, we get a biopsy saying that gastric biopsy uh, to rule out H. pylori, and you have um, a look uh, with all the uh, you know pyloric glands, uh, and you, you're in doubt whether to call it as a, you have negative H. pylori, and you're in doubt whether to call it as a, a body mucosa or antral mucosa. You can always ask your clinical colleagues, or you just simply perform a Gaston IHC. The IHC will be positive in the antrum because the G cells are present only in the antrum, and negative if it is corpus mucosa. So, if you do not have a IHC service, then what you can do? Because uh, you have to differentiate whether it is an autoimmune gastritis or not. So, uh, uh, speaking with the clinician and taking the file and having a look. Uh, the endoscopic report will uh, always help, um, uh, and or else you can you know just give the possibilities of like uh, antral gastritis or ca corpus gastritis based on the endoscopic finding because uh, certain people will have a standalone lab and like may, may not have good uh, rapport with the clinician, so they can give a comment like this. And then, like uh, they can give a comment saying that if the endoscopy shows corpus predominant, predominant gastritis. The clinician can, has to perform the other tests like gastrin level to the demonstrate hypergastrinemia, uh, to demonstrate achlorhydria, and then vitamin B12 and iron deficiency, and the antiparietal cell or uh, IF uh, intrinsic factor antibody to confirm or exclude autoimmune gastritis. This is the best comment which can be given. Uh, so can uh, keep in mind, and we'll have also have to. Uh, Think, uh, but keep in mind that the H. pylori can cause multifocal atrophy. So not only the antrum will be atrophied, the body and the fundus uh, mucosa can also be atrophied. So uh, that we'll have to keep in mind. So uh, if we are seeing some uh, atrophic gastritis in body mucosa, it doesn't always mean that we are dealing with autoimmune gastritis. That is what I want to convey. And this is a gastrin IHC where uh, this is the antral uh, mucosa showing. G cells positive, 
whereas this body mucosa is not showing any G-cells. So autoimmune gastritis can cause linear neuroendocrine hyperplasia like what we see here or nodular neuroendocrine hyperplasia. Later on, it might result in uh, type 1 uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors also. Um, important point here I want to stress is for the, uh, the gastroenterologist as well as the pathologist is that the autoimmune gastritis can show a pseudopolypoidal appearance on endoscopy and uh, the gastroenterologists who, who are not so well experienced might think that these are fundic polyps and when these are biopsied, what we all see will be just a normal looking uh, gastric mucosa. So uh, what the pathologist has to keep in mind is that like uh, since the clinician has told it is a fundic polyp and uh, see, we see here the fundic glands, uh, though we do not have the fixed, uh, proper criteria for calling it as a fundic gland uh, polyp, we should not force ourselves to make a diagnosis of fundic gland polyp. So we'll have to make sure that uh, the dilatation of the uh, the glands are there and they show some mucinous epithelium also to call it as a fundic gland polyp. So if at all we give it as a normal mucosa, maybe the clinician might think that, okay, maybe he has to go again and look in uh, if the, 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 there is something which he has missed and maybe there is a chance that the intervening areas might be sampled uh, and that might demonstrate atrophic gastritis. So uh, now I'm going to show this, in, I've shown this image. Can anyone tell what the diagnosis could be for this particular case? If there is any comment, let me know, please. Anyone has messaged? Okay, uh, so I'll just carry on. So. Uh, this is nothing but uh, lymphocytic gastritis. You see a lot of uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes here within the surface epithelium and as well as the uh, the pits over here. So this is uh, nothing but lymphocytic gastritis, also called the variliform gastritis, where you see the mucosa which appears in nodular here and uh, the central area is depressed. So it is not. Uh, but uh, special, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a pathological pattern which doesn't have any specificity and it can be seen in various conditions like celiac disease, H. pylori, menetrius disease, or NSIs. Uh, the histology will show lots of uh, uh, lymphocytes that is more than 25 per 100 epithelial cells um, and the epithelium will show degenerative changes with foveolar hyperplasia and increased mitosis. The, treat, uh, the, uh, the cost should be treated and the proton pump inhibitors uh, should be given. Uh, this is another biopsy. Uh, can anyone comment on what this could be? Uh, is there any comment? Hello, uh, Nadim sir? Yeah, um, so this, this particular biopsy, can anyone comment? What do you see here? So last, just we had seen a case of, of lymphocytic gastritis and this particular biopsy uh, is also from the antrum. So 
please do not confuse this for collagenous gastritis. I just wanted to highlight this. This is nothing but uh, acute active erosive gastritis where you see there's a lot of fibrin which is involving the, the which is covering the, the surface and there is absolutely no foveolar epithelium at all and this uh, exudate, this is a fibrinous exudate which are mixed with neutrophils though not clearly seen here. Um, so this should not be confused with the collagenous gastritis. So collagenous gastritis uh, will be, uh, you know, the, the surface epithelium will remain intact and you will have uh, sub-epithelial uh, collagen deposition uh, which will uh, encase the superficial capillaries and the inflammatory cells. Uh, so this should not be confused with the erosive gastritis where uh, the uh, fibrinous deposition will be there on the surface. So just uh, don't confuse with that. And the endoscopic appearance is typically nodular. So you, uh, if someone says that there is a nodular uh, appearance endoscopically, you have to, you can keep this in mind. But again, the, the nodules represent the normal mucosa, whereas the depressed areas in between represent the the collagenous areas, which is atrophied and uh, subepithelial collagen deposition. There are two types, the pediatric and the adult types. The pediatric type involves the fundus in the body, whereas the adult type involves the antrum. Uh, pathology is you know not, not clearly known. The pathogenesis is not clearly known, so it might be related to some autoimmune process or celiac disease is what they are saying. And uh, the histology, the subepithelial collagen should be more than equal to 10 microns. This is another uh, a histological image. I just wanted to show. Will anyone be able to comment on this? I do not know. Yes, just let's let's wait for the comment. Let's just wait. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Mm. Yeah, now it is full screen here. Yeah. Okay. No, there are no comments yet. So no comments. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is a special form of gastritis called Russell body gastritis. So. Here, this particular image, the uh, the immunoglobulins are you know very big and uh, quite uh, uh, fairy looking, but you know they are usually not this bad. Uh, so just have to keep in mind that do not confuse the these uh, uh, the Russell bodies for a signet ring cell carcinoma. So if in doubt, you can perform an IHC. It, it this has uh, no uh, you know clinical significance. Just that it is a uh, a pathological entity, nothing else. So just keep in mind and do not confuse it with uh, 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 signet ring cell carcinoma. Next is a special form of gastritis called the focally enhanced gastritis. This particular histo uh, histological image, you can see that the inflammation is quite increased in the lamina propria, but this particular pit shows uh, a busy looking area. See, you can see there's a lot of inflammatory cells surrounding this particular pit and uh, the inflammatory cells are infiltrating uh, this pit and destroying that. So in a focally enhanced gastritis, uh, you will have uh, uh, active inflammation of the uh, the pit uh, with the destruction and uh, then there will be collection of lympho lymphoplasmocytic cells and histiocytes surrounding the pit. And in this particular case, you see some epithelial histiocytes also. In my experience uh, and, you know, some of my mentors uh, who I've worked with have all thought that, like, uh, focally enhanced uh, gastritis have been, uh, are seen to show a high negative predictive value uh, when it comes with the diagnosing uh, uh, Crohn's disease in particular. Uh, not all IBDs, but Crohn's disease in particular. So mainly it has helped us. Uh, to differentiate Crohn's disease from tuberculosis. So this uh, interesting article, what I found is that in pediatric patients uh, of uh, Crohn's disease, presence of uh, negative, uh, uh, presence of focally enhanced gastritis has really helped them to make a diagnosis. It has, it, it, it's seen in almost mo most of the cases of Crohn's disease in their study. So uh, just looking for that, like if if you are able to find out focally enhanced gastritis in a in a normal 
in a routine antral biopsy then you might not say that it is it could be crohn's disease and uh, you don't have to advise for uh, uh, screening for crohn crohn's disease but like but like if if there is a, a a colonoscopy done and then there is a suspicion of crohn's disease and they do an antral biopsy which is routinely done in other centers and there you find the focal lens gastritis then it really helps to making our making a diagnosis of crohn's disease and then is the granulomatous gastritis so granulomas as i said the, the in the focal lens gastritis you may or might not have uh, the uh, granulomas but uh, in in a granulomatous gastritis there are many types but like you know the presence of granulomas is not going to be uh, always for a crohn's disease or a sarcoidosis you you can even have uh, granulomas uh, where, uh, for, when it comes to you know food particle or a foreign foreign material can also uh, result in granulomas uh, certain infections like fungal and bacterial uh, and fun, uh, the parasitic uh, infections also can cause granulomas and uh, the routine thing is that like you will have to uh, see if it is cases or non cases and always do a special stain to differentiate uh, to uh, to rule out other infections and if the granulomas are non necrotizing it is better to give a comment uh, that uh, possibilities of crohn's disease and uh, sarcoidosis needs to be excluded uh, that is uh, up to the clinician for them to work up uh, based upon the uh, the patient's uh, clinical findings but it is always better you give a comment saying that uh, possibilities of crohn's disease and sarcoidosis need exclusion when you find a granuloma and they are not related to Uh, any of the above which i have told you like a foreign body food particle or uh, you know infectious so this is a particular uh, uh, photo micrograph showing a gastric granuloma uh, where you see this inflammation is increased in the lamina propria and uh, this particular area didn't look so nice so uh, on the high power this showed a uh, granuloma here but you know uh, if you are not so sure about this you always Uh, can um, uh, request your uh, technicians to do serial sections and deep cuts you know and serial sections is always better and you can demonstrate the that the granulomas are increasing in size and like uh, they whether uh, you know they they have some substances within them or like it is uh, a case or not so everything will be clear when you go do a, a serial section so don't hesitate and uh, uh, always get a serial section done for uh, such such findings next we'll go on to the uh, drugs drug induced defects we first starting with proton pump inhibitors uh, proton pump inhibitors cause fundic and polyp but they can cause parietal cell hyperplasia and hypertrophy and uh, the glands like what we see here might uh, show a serrated appearance with irregularity and cytoplasmic blebbing uh doesn't have much clinical significance but it is always uh, good that you communicate with them that like uh, this there is parietal cell hyperplasia uh, and it might be a change due to proton pump inhibitor treatment chronic usage so that that will maybe of help uh, to the clinician you can um, uh, he can advise his patient not to do that so i'll show you a case a 55 year old female uh she presents with erosions in the ga gastric body this should be simple so anyone with a diagnosis for this case the gastric epithelium showing maybe the image is not that good but i think it would not uh, be a problem to make a diagnosis the foveolar epithelium looks attenuated with loss of uh, mucinous uh, epithelium uh, and there's like not much of inflammation anyone with a diagnosis so just comments? let's let's wait just let's wait yeah we yeah. Uh, because there's a small lag in the youtube so let's wait if somebody from yeah. the youtube try to attempt oh okay sir just a minute yeah.
Yeah, uh, we have an answer from YouTube by yes. Dr. Firdaus Ibrahim, bile reflux gastritis. Okay, like, yeah, the, he has very well appreciated the changes of the foveal epithelium, but I think these are not bile, so we'll just uh, go and do a pulse stain, and this is what we have got. So, this is Prussian blue positive, uh, iron pill induced gastritis. So, when you find some substance which is golden brown and uh, you know, refractile, uh, just go ahead and do a pulse stain to demonstrate uh, the iron pill induced gastritis. Usually it is seen not in all patients taking iron, but you can get them in patients who have comorbidities or like patients who uh, who can, who, like um, patients on a lot of drugs can develop this kind of uh, iron pill gastritis. And the next is uh, gastric siderosis, which is different. Uh, which is seen with the primary or secondary hemochromatosis where the, the hemocytrin gets deposited uh, deep in the glands and uh, not on the surface or in the lamina propria like what we saw in the previous case. That is that is pill-induced gastritis, that no, iron pill-induced. This is due to uh, hemochromatosis, primary or secondary. Next is uh, a special drug which produces is a drug which produces gastric is the doxycycline which has a special uh, pathological finding that is the superficial mucosal capillaries show eosinophilic degenerative changes and there will be fibrin microthrombi uh, within the superficial vessels. So this is what we see uh, in uh, doxycycline induced gastritis that there is eosinophilic degeneration in the superficial mucosal capillaries and uh, there might be a fibrin, fibrin tombi as well. So uh, when you find some changes like acute erosive gastritis uh, with material looking like uh, you know plasma or uh, fibrin, just you can ask for history of uh, doxycycline intake. So this is a doxycycline induced gastritis. Another drug induced gastritis is the quality sign. So where uh, this is an antimitotic drug which is used in treatment of gout where uh, there is a lot of these ring mitosis and uh, nuclear stratification uh, looking just like a dysplasia. Uh, but uh, when you do a Chi-67, uh, it's not going to be in increased. P53 uh, in the stain is going to show a wild type. So it, it's just the drug-induced changes because of the, uh, uh, the mechanism of action. So usually it doesn't affect all the patients, the quality sign, but uh, patients who have uh, renal failure due to impaired uh, clearance, it uh, goes to the toxic level and causes these kind of changes in the stomach. Um, this kind of changes is also seen with the drug called the uh, the taxol groups, the paclitaxel, docetaxel and so on. So this has to be kept in mind. So uh, when you see certain changes, where you're not so convinced of dysplasia, like lot of mitosis with the uh, enlargement of the nucleus. So uh, you can ask for a chemotherapy drug intake or uh, this history of drug uh, gout with uh, usage of colchicine. Then this is another special form of gastritis. So uh, I think since there is a lack of time, I'll just describe myself. I thought I'll ask for the uh, people to comment and these uh, the audience to comment but here uh, no, like no, the no, previous no lack of time. you can you can ask them to okay. yeah 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 okay that fine. Would be good, actually. fine so uh, anyone with a comment about this particular biopsy So what we see here is like uh, the fovea, this is but this is from the anthem and you see the uh, foveolar epithelium like a you know will will form appearance and then here you see a more of serrated appearance. A anyone with a comment? Yeah, uh, Doctor Devilina Roy says foveolar cell hyperplasia. Yeah, that's right. Foveolar hyperplasia, but uh, when you want want to call, you want to give a definite diagnosis for this, what do you would call this as? So, 
uh, this is a special yes, form of uh, yes, yes, reactive gastritis with foveal or something. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. So this is a reactive gastropathy. So uh, this is a chemical induced uh, gastro gastropathy, which might be seen with the biliary duodenal pancreatic or reflex, and uh, also with the NSAIDs and other uh, weak alkali or acids, e even with uh, frequent alcohol intake. So as, as uh, rightly pointed out by, by both of them, there is prominent foveolar hyperplasia with typical attenuation of the foveolar mucinous epithelium. See, when we see the previous uh, images, the foveolar epithelium is very thick, but what we see here is a thinned out foveolar mu mucin. The, it is completely attenuated and then uh, the corkscrew appearance of these foveolar epithelium and there is very sparse inflammatory infiltrate doesn't look like a gastritis at all and there will be a lot of fibromuscular uh, proliferation in the lamina propria and uh, there will be vascular dilatation and congestion as well in the uh, lamina propria. Uh, similar uh, change will be seen with gastric and uh, uh, vascular ectasia as well but the only thing different is that we will have uh, thrombi in the superficial capillaries and the endoscopist is going to say that this is a watermelon stomach and usually I, I I think I have seen only one case of uh, gas before. So it is not going to be so usual. So this is another next case. Next case I'm going to uh, give it to you for your diagnosis. 60 year old male with hematomesis. Upper GI endoscopy shows a large ulceration below the gastroesophageal junction. It extends up to the distal body of the stomach. The margins are regular and there is nodularity noted around the distal body. So this is the biopsy which we see here. So this is another image and this is another image. Anyone with a diagnosis or like how to work it up? Shall I move on? Somebody has replied as amyloid, Dr. Arpita Pandit. Yeah, yeah very good. Yeah, so we better that we go uh, go ahead and do Congo Red. And then this is uh, uh, inofluorescent uh, microscope by Duke Texas Red Filter to uh, demonstrate the amyloid deposition. So next, we we'll, this is all for stomach. And next, we'll uh, go with the small bubble. So, in small bubble, what do we look for? Is first thing, the foremost thing is the villus architecture. Uh, as earlier, I told that the proper orientation of the biopsy is very important for that. The crypt architecture and the villus architecture uh, is going to be uh, the first thing which we'll have to look for. And next is the surface epithelium. Surface epithelium, um, maybe not for the adult patients, but for the infants and the uh, pediatric patients, uh, we might be interested in that, but I'm not going to uh, show any of those, like uh, uh, microvillous inclusion disease or a tufting entropathy, uh, because those are very rare, so I'm not going to go in detail. But if it comes to the infants, infants and the pediatric, you will have to look for the surface epithelium like if there are some uh, lipid vacuoles like in an A-beta lipoproteinemia and so on. And then increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes. Hmm. We are very much interested in that when it comes to the small bowel. Then the subepithelial collagen deposition like in collagenous through. Then in the lamina propria, what we will have to look for? Lymphocytes and plasma cells. You know, their presence is normal. They are normally present in the lamina propria. If they are absent, then it is abnormal. But neutrophils and eosinophils, eosinophils may be uh, uh, present, but if they are increased, then it is abnormal. Neutrophils, uh, if they are present, then it means it is pathological. Then the other cell which you will have to look for is mast cell. So mast cell may be uh, uh, not as a part of systemic mastocytosis, 
but their increase is also has been related to irritable bowel syndromes and the muscle activation syndrome and so on so we will have to look in for muscles as well and then granulomas then uh, is there is anything like a leukocytoplastic vasculitis you know in the in the mucosal capillaries amyloid deposition in the lamina propria or the submucosa and then you have to look for the crypt apoptosis uh, if there is crypt apoptosis go and look for the presence of corpus cells and pana cells and uh, last but not the least the parasites the uh, idea cryptosporidium and so on so this in uh, is in a like the list with what all i will look for in a small bowel biopsy so uh, this is a duodenal biopsy of a patient with uh, celiac disease is a properly oriented biopsy where we see mild villus blunting this looks okay kind of we can say mild or is it it's fine but these will i don't look that great um, and there is definite increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes so the uh, talking about intraepithelial lymphocytes the sections to examine should be approximately 4 microns uh, thicker sections might uh, give a wrong value so it is better we use a 4 micron thickness sections and always use the hi- highest power 40x to count the cells and a total of 500 epithelial cells have to be counted and uh, the number of uh, lymphocytes uh, per 500 epithelial cells have to be Uh, calculated for a hundred value, uh, and that is an average for hundred. And the count has to be taken only in the upper third of the villi. So only this part, this portion, has to be used for counting. The mid and the lower third uh, are not right for counting intraepithelial lymphocytes. So uh, that has to be kept in mind. And you should avoid counting intraepithelial lymphocytes over lymphoid aggregates. So whenever there is a lymphoid aggregate in the lamina propria, the particular villi above that is going to show intraepithelial lymphocytes. So it has to be avoided while counting. And uh, more than 30 intraepithelial lymphocytes per 100 epithelial cells is significant. And when there is a borderline like 25 and so on, uh, you can use uh, CD3 IHC to uh, make the count. But I have not used it before, so but it, it is better that you use the IHC to make count in borderline cases. The crypt hyperplasia is a subjective and it's not a, a useful criteria even um, when it comes to modified Marsh classification. But um, the what it uh, implies is that the crypts hy- will be hyperplastic, elongated, or tortuous. So that it comes as Marsh two. So for uh, the grade, the classification purpose, it can be used. Then is the villus atrophy. So the like the image what, what which I have shown uh, to you here, there is a Brana gland, and this particular mucosal punch is uh, uh, including the Brana gland. And here we see the villus we look atrophied, but actually this is a completely normal uh, biopsy and normal mucosa. Uh, the other punches are completely fine with long villi, so you have to avoid uh, the villi which are above the Brana's gland and the lymphoid aggregate uh, because it might show a wrong impression there of villus planting. So it has to be graded as mild, moderate, and marked. And the normal villi uh, is uh, approximately one to two to one is to four crypto villus ratio. So in the Indian. And the southeastern uh, population, uh, the villi to crypt ratio is approximately one is to two to one is to three. In the Western world, it is one is to three to one is to four. So the villi are longer in the Western world and uh, moderate height in the uh, in India and Southeast Asia. So in a newly diagnosed celiac disease, modified Marsh classification will be uh, important because uh, only for this reason that. Uh, the patient might be given a gluten free diet and then uh, a repeat biopsy uh, will be followed to see for the response histologically so for that reason a modified mass classification will be helpful so if a patient uh, presents and then biopsy shows uh, uh, mass class 3a and then later he is biopsied and uh, shows mass class 2 or 1 so that means he has improved a lot so uh, for that reason it is helpful and intraepithelial lymphocyte 
ptosis will be the last to get resolved so uh, we'll have to keep in mind and always when it when there is a clinical suspicion with a positive serology it is always right to give uh, the modified mass classification and give a diagnosis of a uh, compatible or uh, suggestive of celiac disease because histopathology alone is not confirmatory so you can give a comment saying that uh, based on the clinical and the uh, serological finding the histomorphology is uh, compatible with the diagnosis of celiac disease or suggestive of celiac disease like that i am going to show you another one case a uh, 35 year old male with anemia and abdominal discomfort uh, this is a biopsy from the duodenum uh this is a punch and this was contributed by my friend dr abjit and uh, what do you see here uh, can anyone comment Th this is the uh, low power image this is this is high power image and uh, some more higher power images here So just let's wait let's wait yeah Dr Manoj Kaur says increased in intraepithelial lymphocytes very good Okay. Anything else? Uh, so I'll, I'll just to show you this place. Uh, uh, again, uh, so you know, I think there's more to that. Anyway. Okay. So yeah. I think people can. Uh, If anyone can know what these are, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so I you... think yeah. So uh, I'll I'll continue, sir. So fine, yeah. okay, fine. So I I thought you will be able to find this, and I have an I have another one for you. I thought yeah, I'll so search for the yeah. other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah. good yeah so there is increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes and you see a lot of uh, the idea so uh, villus atrophy and increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes are not specific for celiac disease you will have to try and rule out all the other conditions which i'll be showing in you show you in the later slides but you know i wanted to surprise you with the, with this case with another diagnosis like what you see here Uh, is that like uh, are you able to see any plasma cells in this? Uh, there are lymphocytes, but there are no plasma cells. And what you see here again is that the lymphoid aggregates are present, but there are absolutely no plasma cells. And there is a, a infection with GID also. So uh, I guess uh, the rabbits are tried uh, using. using the cd 138 ic and uh, there were means very few or absolutely no plasma cells so this is a case of cvid that is common variable immunodeficiency with the gid infection so if uh, an adult presents with gid or any of the opportunistic infection and uh, clinically seems to be immunocompetent so then uh, just try to look in for these plasma cells um, and you can advise clinical workup also so then another case 10 year old female with abdominal pain and diarrhea and uh, malabsorption symptom uh, so this is showing less atrophy and lot of uh, inflammatory cells in the lamina propria and uh, more higher power images where you see this
uh, when we are dealing with the pediatric patients we we'll have to keep this in mind so what i wanted to show in these scripts is that the goblet cells are absent so you don't see goblet cells and you don't see panet cells and you see lot of apoptosis so uh, this is a case of uh, autoimmune enteropathy which can be syndromic also and rarely it can be seen in adults uh, and and uh, uh, the what one thing which you will have to uh, see is that like uh, in autoimmune enteropathy the uh, amount of intraepithelial lymphocytes will not be proportion proportionate to the uh, the the villus atrophy are, you are seeing that like in uh, celiac disease when there is total villus atrophy the intraepithelial lymphocytes might be marked but here in autoimmune enteropathy when there is complete uh, villus atrophy you will not see that much of uh, uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes so uh, that might be a additional finding uh, when you are dealing with this case Uh, if you are not finding enough intraepithelial lymphocytes you can go and look for uh, the uh, uh, the up increase in apoptosis in the crypts and then the lack of uh, panet cells in the goblet cells so <clears throat> when uh, we are dealing with a small bowel biopsy uh, how to approach not all increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes and villus atrophy or celiac disease clinical history is very important Uh, serology is mandatory when uh, we are dealing with celiac disease uh, you, we, we might get false positive and false negative cases but uh, there is no diagnosis without serology there are multiple dds for in increase in intraepithelial lymphocytosis uh, and uh, villus atrophy so we'll have to try and exclude all the con other conditions before giving a suggestion of celiac disease like you know uh, travel history to uh, places where uh, tropical sprue is endemic and then uh, you have to ask for anything like a you know a stasis related or like if the patient is having something like a stricture which might result in um, problems uh, with the uh, uh, motility and then uh, there might be bacterial overgrowth syndromes which can also cause villus atrophy and increase intraepithelial lymphocytes and uh, history of drug is also very important so uh, if uh, anti tissue transglutaminase is negative and the biopsy is suggestive of celiac disease uh, they the clinician can always uh, put the patient uh, with a trial of gluten restriction and see for improvement after 6 months and very important point to note here is the presence of neutrophils you know when there is a villus atrophy with increase in uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes and there is presence of neutrophils it is less likely that it is celiac disease it is usually seen with the bacterial overgrowth autoimmune enteropathy crohn's disease and sometimes even in uh, tropical sprue but not uh, very usually but bacterial overgrowth and uh, autoimmune enteropathy typically show more of uh, active inflammation that is neutrophils and the crohn's disease also can show a lot of neutrophils so this has to be kept in mind and if when there is a focal active inflammation uh, with the normal villus architecture it might be due to other conditions like infections nsaids uh, you know besets disease or a leukocytoplastic vasculitis uh, this is uh, another case which i would like to get your comments on like this is an adult patient uh, which i'll tell you that this since this image is not that great i'll tell you that this biopsy looked more like a, a autoimmune enteropathy but here we see a lot of goblet cells the goblet cells are preserved but there was apoptosis and uh, there was there is villus atrophy here and uh, there is lot of increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes but the uh, celiac serology is negative and uh, autoimmune enteropathy workup is also negative so what will you ask the physician uh, is my question to you anyone with a comment we are waiting yeah
Dr. Manoj says, any history of transplant? Ah, that is great, yes. So history of transplant to exclude GVHT, fine. So if I say that there is no history of transplant, So fine, okay, I, I, I'll go ahead uh, yeah, yeah, please. with this. So this is uh, all certain entropathy. So it is going to look exactly, it, this is an angiotensin 2 receptor inhibitor for hypertension, and it is going to show uh, villus atrophy, increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes, there's going to be increased apoptosis in the crypts. there's going to be loss of goblet cells, but panet cells will be preserved. And so there can be sub epithelial collagen increase also. So in an adult patient, when you have findings, which is looking like an autoimmune entropathy, check for this drug. Uh, 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 cessation of this drug will lead to improvement uh, of the patient symptoms as well as the endoscopic uh, features, which will be seen. So when you find a lot of apoptosis, what what all you have to think about is uh, in a pediatric patients and also in adult patients you have to think of autoimmune entropathy, drugs like colmesatan and other drugs which I'll be uh, talking about uh, tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow in the next session, uh, GVHT as the doctor rightly pointed out and also CMV infection. So when you see increased uh, cryptopoptosis with lots of neutrophils. Uh, just try to look in for uh, CMV inclusions. If not, then you can try IHC also, like particularly in uh, immunocompromised patients. Uh, as I said, for autoimmune entropathy, you will have to look for panel cells and goblet cells. Uh, goblet cells, um, you have to keep in mind that goblet cells may be absent in a regenerating uh, mucosa, but panel cells will be present. But suppose if uh, the biopsy has been uh, performed uh, at the site of a healing ulcer, uh, it might seem that the goblet cells are absent because it is a regenerating mucosa, but you will not be able to see increased apoptosis uh, and uh, the panel cells will be present. So this is the thing. So next is the refractory celiac disease. It's like when uh, the patient is not showing any response histologically and clinically for at least six months, uh, it means the patient is having refractory celiac disease. So when uh, you have a refractoriness to gluten-free diet, you have to try and exclude all the other causes which we have uh, gone through, like the autoimmune entropathy, uh, the drug-induced entropathy, uh, CVID, common variable immunodeficiency, tropical sprue, or uh, collagenous sprue, uh, and, and so on. So these patients, even if they are celiac uh, uh, patients, serologies in some patients might be negative also. And there are two types. The RCD1 is a benign type, uh, nothing to worry about. And maybe they'll try with some uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, but if it is RCD2, most of the patients progress on to uh, entropathy associated T-cell lymphoma, the details of which will be uh, covered by another uh, doctor on um, lymphoid lesions of the GIT. So I'll not be talking in detail about this. The next is uh, the involvement of uh, 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 henoxalin purpura in the GIT. So I have uh, seen a couple of cases, but unfortunately I don't have the histological images. Uh, whenever uh, there is focal active inflammation in the duodenum or anywhere in the small bowel with the uh, uh, you know neutrophilic exudates, try and look for uh, features of leukocytoplastic vasculitis in the lamina propria. Uh, the changes will be exactly similar to the leukocytoplastic vasculitis, which you are going to see in the skin with the endothelial cell swelling and fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall, extravasation of RBCs. So everything is just going to be uh, similar. And these changes will, will precede, might precede the cutaneous lesion. So the patient might present with the GI uh, symptoms and then get getting biopsied for that. So keep in mind about this also. Then is uh, eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Uh, eosinophil uh, presence in the lamina propria uh, has many differentials. And uh, they say that like if, uh, if it is more than 20 eosinophils per uh, high power field, it is abnormal, but you know, I don't rely with the counts, but 
i see for other things like uh, the degranulation and spread to the submucosa as markers for uh, eosinophilic gastroenteritis and even when these are there we'll have to try and exclude other conditions like like uh, celiac disease crohn's disease presence of parasites and have to exclude vasculitis and so on and uh, the, the eosinophilic gastroenteritis can involve the stomach and the esophagus Uh, in the esophagus this will be different from the eosinophilic esophagitis like in the eosinophilic esophagitis you might see increase in inter- eosinophils in the epithelium whereas in gastroenteritis you will be seeing the eosinophils in the lamina propria so that will be the difference so we'll move on to the terminal ileum ic valve and cecum and uh, after this uh, the colon will be discussed in the uh, next session so the main thing in uh, terminal ileum cecum and the ileocecal valve will, will be the ulcer so and the uh, site is going to get biopsied frequently for uh, ascites ulcers or any type of ulcer that uh, usually you know uh, i think may, most of us will know that like you will get a requisition form saying that ascites ulcer seen in the terminal ileum to rule out ibd bar crohn's disease this is the routine uh, thing you are going to get so but what we'll have we know that like ascites ulcers are not specific for crohn's disease so it, though it is an initial finding in crohn's disease it is never specific for uh, crohn's disease uh, what is an ascites ulcer histologically they are like nothing but superficial erosions of the surface epithelium which will be covered with neutrophilic exudate and usually they are seen above the pears patches which will be hyperplastic and there might be formation of a small uh, inflammatory granulation tissue just below the ulcer and this can be seen with various conditions like uh, viral infections bacterial infections tuberculosis nsi uh, uh, therapy and then eosinophilic enteritis also so when uh, it is superficial ulcer what uh, we call is that when there is a well formed inflammatory granulation tissue involving a proportion of the uh, surface epithelium and the lamina propria so then we call it as a superficial ulcer and this also is seen with various conditions but when there is a deep ulcer and the uh, biopsy punch which uh, which is there on the slide is showing complete inflammatory granulation tissue then we consider it as a deep ulcer fissuring also we might not be able to see in a small biopsy uh, but when when that particular uh, tissue that a tissue fragment which you are having is completely formed by inflammatory granulation tissue or the base uh, is formed by the uh, the muscular mucosa then we call it as a deep ulcer it does have significance and uh, though we cannot give a confirmatory diagnosis of uh, crohn's disease without other supporting evidences but we will have to keep in mind that okay there is something serious going on so this is an example of uh, ascites ulcer where you see the superficial erosion um, and surface ulceration with the, this lot of thick neutrophilic exudate with uh, fibrin almost looks like a pseudo membranous colitis right but it is not uh, this is in the terminal ileum uh, and then another important thing is the pyloric gland metaplasia pyloric metaplasia or eosinophilic metaplasia i don't have the image for eosinophilic metaplasia but these are the images for pyloric uh, metaplasia where the crypts uh, they undergo the uh, morphological uh, change and they look like the pyloric glands of the stomach mucinous glands of the stomach so the uh, they don't have uh, the goblet cell morphology uh, they the, the terminology for this has been uh, uh, there is another terminology called ulcer associated uh, cell lineage also so basically they what they want to convey is that uh, this is a morphological change because of regeneration continuous inflammation and regeneration so uh, when we see this uh, it means that there is a continuous insult going on at that particular site and there is continuous inflammation and regeneration going on at that site so it means that the terminal ileum is chronically and actively inflamed so uh, uh, you, you can get to know that okay there is some pathology which is not active which is not only acute and which is not non specific so that you can make sure when you find this particular pseudopyloric metaplasia
so when you find granulomas um, and uh, if it is like in uh, crohn's disease uh, the granulomas that can be seen at any any level they can be uh, seen subepithelially intercryptal close to the muscular is mucosa uh, or submucosally and the sizes range from small epithelial collection like one or two three cells uh three cells uh, in a particular place uh, to microgranuloma and then to medium sized granuloma rarely uh, isolated giant cells also can be seen uh, we'll have to look for other evidences like uh, ulcers and active inflammation and then chronic changes like uh, as i showed you the pyloric metaplasia then panacell metaplasia when in uh, in the uh, colon distal to transverse colon and basal plasma cytosis and mu mucus depletion and so on so if there is an isolated granuloma uh, in a non inflamed mucosa that uh, if 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 you get a biopsy from the terminal ileum and there is a single granuloma and the mucosa is absolutely fine so it is not right to give a diagnosis of crohn's disease instead you can just give uh, the changes are seen and then you can advise follow up and repeat biopsy uh, because the granuloma may be due to any other cause uh, which i'll be discussing later this is a histo the photo micrograph of uh, granuloma in the terminal ileum see here you can see a small granuloma just below the uh, the surface epithelium though the uh, mucosa is not inflamed in this particular punch the other punches showed a lot of inflammation uh, both active and chronic so uh, this is a case of crohn's disease here is a high power image uh, this you will have to hunt for the granulomas or epithelial connections in cases of crohn's disease uh, you will have to look closely you will have to go field by field to look for these because uh, it will completely change your diagnosis with, uh, and will be of great help for the clinician as well as the patient so uh, giving maybe a non specific diagnosis might not so uh, just to try to look in for the villi near the the lacteals so that is the place where these granulomas will be hiding um, mainly the uh, near the muscular is mucosa also so you can look for this is another example where uh, this granuloma is quite well formed and seen below the surface epithelium here again here there is not much of uh, inflammation going on this particular punch so that is the thing so here i want to show an example of another uh, granuloma here so what do you think about this granuloma i'll show you a hyper image of the same so this particular granuloma anyone would like to comment about this granuloma uh, would you call it as a crohn's disease in this with this particular granuloma okay so if there is no one to comment uh, this is actually a cryptolytic granuloma so the appearance is completely different where uh, you see these granulomas to be more loose with a lot of inflammatory cells uh, with along with the epithelial histiocyte uh, you can see a part of the crypt here the crypt is here and you see uh, some epithelial collection here admixed with the inflammatory cells so this is a cryptolytic granuloma and should not be confused with a discrete uh, epithelial cell granuloma and you know it, uh, the infective colitis and the crohn's disease almost has a similar histological presentation in certain cases like uh, the inflammation can be patchy uh, and may be uh, seen in uh, one or two punches in both the conditions so uh, when you find this a cryptolytic granuloma in a inflam a, a, in an infective colitis this should not make you diagnose crohn's disease and uh, uh, the treatment is going to be absolutely different so <clears throat> when you find a granuloma which is loose and uh, which are admixed with inflammatory cells just try and uh, do some uh, serial sections uh, and you will be able to find out the uh, crypt epithelium or a part of the epithelium which comes out uh, in the subsequent sections uh, with experience you will be able to easily make it out that like these are cryptolytic and not discrete granulomas 
uh, what i use is that like uh, when they are loose and somewhat mucinous uh, without the eosinophilic cytoplasm i don't feel comfortable calling them as uh, true discrete granulomas but when they are with the typical pink cytoplasm and like uh, you know uh, without absolutely no inflammatory cells maybe one or two lymphocytes and eosinophils can be seen but when they are with admixed with neutrophils i feel uncomfortable so next is the suppurative granuloma so this particular granuloma is showing central uh, neutrophilic microabscess and this granuloma is staying within a large lymphoid aggregate this is uh, usually the the disease for suppurative granulomas include eosinia pseudotuberculosis even it can be seen in crohn's disease Uh, tuberculosis infection mycobacterial tuberculosis or fungal so you will have to work up by doing an afb and then pas or a gms to rule out the other infective causes and eosinia uh, they can perform a pcr but it is not necessary uh, we can ask for history of travel to the west where uh, the eosinia infection is uh, particularly prevalent and like maybe a course of antibiotics uh, would uh, help these patients so not all granulomas are crohn's disease even though if it is a uh, suppurative and not caseous so uh, in eosinia in particular uh, the granulomas the uh, changes are restricted to the terminal ileum and the uh, cecum the right colon mainly and these granulomas are restricted to the lymphoid follicles they are seen in the center of the lymphoid follicles and mo- most of the time they are suppurative so that that can uh, that will be helpful to differentiate it from crohn's uh, granulomas then is the tuberculosis uh, as we all know it will be necrotizing and large if it is non necrotizing uh, how to approach it like uh, always afb and tissue pcr can be done but if again they are negative so what will be the approach like so in tuberculosis the granulomas are usually Uh, deep near the muscularis mucosae and in the sub, uh, submucosa very very rarely uh, the granulomas can be seen uh, in, in, close to the mucosa or beneath the uh, epithelium uh, maybe i think one case i have seen where the granulomas were so small with few epithelial collection close to the uh, surface epithelium uh, so uh, the thing is that like uh, the uh, changes which are seen in the terminal ileum and the ic valve uh, can be so similar to crohn's disease so the distinction becomes uh, difficult in certain cases like the pseudopyloric metaplasia can be seen patchy inflammation can be seen crypt architectural can be changes can be seen just like crohn's disease so what i use uh, as a histological marker is that like I, as i told you earlier the focal act, focally enhanced gastritis uh, which uh, i shown the image earlier uh, so in our uh, centers we get antral biopsies routinely when there is a, a diagnosis with clinical suspicion of ibd mainly the crohn's disease so that really has you know whenever there is a, 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 a non hepatic related gastritis particularly the focally active focally enhanced gastritis uh, i would lean more towards the crohn's disease so having said that like uh, if the other changes are not very marked uh, i would not be brave enough to call it crohn's uh, uh, you know uh, just like that maybe i'll give a comment saying that i favor crohn's more than tuberculosis and uh, they will have to exclude all the other Uh, with uh, with the help of microbiological parameters to exclude the infective etiology so um, you can also look for another important thing which i want to stress is that like uh, the segmental colonic biopsies have been very helpful so whenever it's an ibd particularly crohn's or uh, ulcerative colitis multiple biopsies Uh, taken from the terminal ileum uh, the ascending colon the transverse the sigmoid and the rectum has been very helpful uh, because uh, you know in crohn's disease uh, uh, the inflammation uh, can be seen even though if the endoscopy is completely normal at the those sites and uh, not only inflammation the microgranulomas can very well be seen at those sites 
so uh, when these sites are examined and you find granulomas in these sites uh, it is so easy to make a diagnosis of crohn's disease uh, rather than scratching the head whether it's a uh, crohn's or tb so uh, that will be very helpful so if uh, your uh, clinicians are not doing that you can just ask them to do segmental uh, colonic biopsies um, when they suspect crohn's disease or when they have a difficulty differentiating crohn's and tuberculosis so when you have a gut feeling you know particularly you feel that the granulomas are uh, you know large and it seems like tuberculosis it's definitely going to be tuberculosis what i have uh, seen is that like if you search search and search you will definitely get it so you have to do an extensive search with the fp stain uh, try to see for the all the serials in that particular section and try to uh, use the oil immersion to find for the bacilli so when you are dealing with granulomas you have to be aware of the stomal cells vascular structures and histiocytes which are going to mimic uh, granulomas so do not con- commit until you are very certain about that particularly in a lymphoid aggregate the center of the lymphoid aggregate uh, it shows uh, the stomal cells which look like the uh, the granuloma so you have to be uh, certain about that so get an opinion from your friends or like uh, no one i think ever will use an ihc but still you can just uh, use an ihc if you are in doubt so when it is a non necrotizing granuloma with the negative afb uh, so as i said like we have since we have discussed extensively it will be the same like when it's a crohn's disease you see uh, deep ulcers and architectural changes changes in the other colonic sites involvement of the antrum and the other uh, areas in the small bowel you can favor crohn's disease but when there is a large granuloma or a medium sized granuloma uh, and it's unlikely it's a, uh, it's a unlikely a crohn's disease so if it is a large granuloma it is not going to be crohn's disease and the mucosal changes are if they are mild again it's not going to be a crohn's disease so crohn's disease produces a lot of mucosal changes so uh, if it is not showing that then it's unlikely to be a crohn's disease so Uh, apart from tuberculosis what else you have to keep in mind is sarcoidosis if it is a non necrotizing granuloma like uh, we might not see the usual uh, changes of crohn's disease like that granuloma and granuloma appearance and uh, lack of lymphoid cuff naked granulomas maybe not seen so classically here but uh, you can have a diagnosis of sarcoidosis if the afb and other tests are negative and that there is a clinician for further investigation like a ul scan chest uh, ct or and so on so that is all from me today so for the next session we will uh, meet on monday fantastic wonderful Thank really you, nice presentation and you went very nicely and you explained things so well especially the difficult areas especially the areas uh, in the stomach or how to handle those various types of you know gastritis the history is very important at times and and also the importance of you know <clears throat> taking multiple biopsies in the colon and the intestine to rule out you know inflammatory bowel disease many yeah. a time when it becomes very difficult mm-hmm. and uh, there is one question from the youtube with dr minesh gandhi wants to know your experience with sarcina ventriculi on gastric biopsy uh yes sir so before answering that question uh, like i have a separate uh, slide on the bugs of the git so i'll be oh. covering that oh, fine fine so then we'll wait for that yeah. i think let's let's yeah. let's uh, yes very nice uh, there are a lot of uh, comments Thanks. from the youth very nice presentation excellent presentation it was really very nice. session i mean we have we have learned a lot especially the smaller thing to see and how to correlate one from the other and you know how to uh, where to count the intraepithelial lymphocytes those small small things are very important these biopsies you know so you've done it very well thank you so yes. much dr so i think we'll see you on monday is thank that right you, yes sir thank you sir so, thanks a lot thank you bye bye take care bye